Hi everyone. This is going to be an introduction to our Raku glaze that we're going to be doing on our little Raku projects in uh, Ceramics 1 and Ceramics 2. Now the Raku glazes I have positioned all on this cart and you can see I've kind of divided them. They're in numerical order because the Raku glazes uh, are labeled such as uh, R9, R12, R13, 14, 16, 17. I put them in numerical order so you can put it back where it belongs when you're done using it. Um, the only one that's not a Raku glaze but it works fine, that's our low fire black. This is uh, the black magic. It's normally on the, the shelf in the back. My students, when you come back here and you're going to be glazing your Raku pots, make sure that you don't pick glazes from elsewhere in the room. Make sure that you're using only from this cart. Now, if you forget what I'm about to show you, this little cheat sheet will help give you the information that you need. It's the tips to try to remember. The first thing that I tell my students is when you come back here, I usually don't have people rinse their pots off, primarily because this is so porous, if you rinse it and then immediately glaze, it will be too saturated with water in order to accept the glaze as you're putting it on. Um, if it is quite messy and you need to rinse it, I would maybe recommend that you rinse it the day before, let it sit on the cart and dry, and uh, then you can come back and you can continue glazing the next day. The second thing is you want to mix your glaze to the proper consistency. And you can see I have written down like a melted milkshake. I feel like most people can kind of visualize what a melted milkshake will look like. So if I were to grab one of these glazes here, when you go to mix it up, I do not recommend, don't shake it, because uh, shaking it will sometimes cause the lid to pop off and it goes everywhere. Use one of our glaze brushes and you wanna put it all the way down in the bottom and you wanna mix it well. Make sure that it's mixed up evenly. Now, when it looks like a melted milkshake, the glaze will flow right off the brush, okay? If it's thick and clumpy, we will need to modify it some. Sometimes we can just add a tablespoon or two of water. If it's much thicker, I have an additive that we will put in it to make it flowable and brushable once again. The step number three says glaze the inside first. The reason that we glaze the inside first is sometimes, say like on this particular one, I glazed the black first and I poured it out. When you glaze the inside first, sometimes you get dribbles on the outside and you want to wipe them off. Well, you don't wanna have a glaze already on the outside or you're going to ruin your good outside glaze job. So do the inside first so when you pour it out, you can wipe off dribbles. This is pretty much true for just about glazing anything. Um, sometimes when you open up a glaze, it might still have a foil on it. You can take a knife or a tool or your finger and release that foil and then you can throw that foil away. The foil is so when it is shipping, uh, during the shipping, it won't leak. So with this new glaze, as I stick the brush in there, it will begin to become more liquidy and you wanna make sure that it is really thoroughly mixed. So, it is flowing a, a little bit off the brush. I'm just gonna add a little bit of water to it. So maybe a tablespoon or a little bit more just to thin it out just a wee bit. There we go. And now that flows nicely off the brush. Now this does say glaze the inside first, so I have my glaze mixed up and I'm going to pour it on the inside. If you have a wide enough opening, you can pour it directly in there. If you have a really super skidding opening, you could use a funnel to get it in there. I have a set of funnels in the back. I am going to pour this in, okay? You don't need to go that full and then pour it out and rotate it. So you can see how I'm rotating it around. When you rotate it, as you pour it back out, then you're able to cover the entire inside. Now you can see where I accidentally dribbled. 
I will have to sponge that off. I sponge off the stuff that I dribbled on the outside before I paint the outside. Even if I'm painting the same color, I'm gonna sponge it off because if you don't, it goes on a little extra heavy there and it's going to look slightly discolored. Now the inside is done and I'm ready to glaze the exterior. Now, step number four says brush glaze the outside. You want to put three layers for smooth surfaces, but two layers on heavily textured surfaces. So as I put glaze on this, if I have a heavy texture, this one isn't quite heavy, but I am only going to put two layers on there. So as I brush this around, you can see how the texture will just naturally collect a little bit more glaze than a smooth surface. So I will put a total of two layers on there. Now I will mention, you will notice I did not do any wax on the bottom of this like we did uh, previously. It's because we're not dipping it. Wax is really only super helpful when you're dipping in a uh, glaze. And then I'm doing the other side. When the first layer is dry enough to the touch that I can touch it and it won't get on my fingers, then I'll be ready for the second layer. When you all are glazing your pieces, you're going to take the glaze to your table to glaze at your table. I'm only doing it back here for the demonstration since I'm right here at the cart. Areas that are smooth, such as the side of this and the top, will get a total of three layers. All right, this coat is getting close to dry enough. I think I'll go ahead and do my second and final layer on the texture area. You do have to keep count of how many layers you have. Occasionally I'll have someone that will come to me and say, do I have enough glaze? And I'll ask them how many layers they put on and they're like, oh, I don't know. I just kept putting it on. So it's really difficult uh, to, to help in the case of uh, not paying attention to your layers because you really uh, want it to be consistent. So this is now the second layer on the opposite side. While I'm letting that dry, I want to go ahead and show you some of the glaze colors that I have here on the cart. All right. Starting with Black Magic, which is our low fire black. The internal part of this is black, and it's just a nice, glossy, shiny black. Next is R9, which is a white crackle. The white crackle is a beautiful white crackle. Um, it might have big cracks or little cracks. It's hard to predict how it's going to come out, but it's the prettiest white crackle that I have. And then I have some Amico glazes. This is R12. Bluebell. Bluebell is like a light bluish green and it's really got a good crackle a lot of times. It sometimes can have a little bit of copper reduction, but it's mostly the blue green. This one is smoky blue. This is R13. It's usually kind of a nice cobalt blue and it often has crackle and sometimes it might have the iridescent copper uh, that might pop up in a little spot. Next is R14, that is smoky lilac. It really is a very pretty light kind of a lilac. Um, it looks a little uh, grayer here because my texture, I couldn't actually clean out uh, the textures super well um, after the Raku firing. Next is R16, copper patina. Now copper patina can have any of the uh, typical colors of copper. So it could have this orangish reddish color, purpley color, blue, greens, uh, yellows. It could have any variety and this particular one, I don't know how well you can see it, this particular one does have a pretty good variety of colors there. And because this had a lot of texture, it kind of trapped little areas of reduction more than others. 
R17, this is tarnished silver. This isn't a great example, but tarnished silver is a real nice one. And it very is, it's very well named. It very much looks like old silver, which is tarnished. Next one is R18, that's lustrous copper. And I have to admit, this is a very old sample. This is an old student sample. It's probably 10 years old. It used to be much brighter. I have found that some of the copper colors will oxidize over the years and they will get a little bit more dull and finish. Um, I, I have to admit, I sometimes have a difficult time telling copper patina and copper lustrous copper apart. They're both really good coppers. You can't go wrong with any. But if you want the really super high shine, I would go with lustrous. Next one is Red Crackle, and this stripe on here is Red Crackle. This one is Red Crackle. Um, red Crackle is uh, more of an earthy red. I sometimes have students that are asking for like a more of a brighter Ohio State kind of scarlet red. Um, this is not going to be that. It's a little bit more earthy, but it's a lovely red. The next one that I have is Yellow Crackle. Now, I have to admit, I never get yellow crackle to turn out yellow. It always has like a light brown look. So if we just called it light brown crackle, it might be more appropriate. Um, I know I've got a lot of uh, carbon trapping that's in that blaze, so it, it doesn't really come out a true yellow for us, but it's a, still a pretty crackle. And then lastly, over here, uh, I have these little bitty uh, like baby food jars. They have some stains and oxides for accents only. If you put on your layers of glaze and you want to put an accent, you can use one layer of the oxide on top of your normal regular layers of the regular glaze. Lighter glazes work best in order to put the oxides on, on top. So white definitely works great. Bluebell works really well. The yellow one would work well. Um, I don't recommend it on coppers um, or, of course, the black. Um, it just doesn't show up well. All right, so going back to this, I have one more layer to do, and then I will need to wipe the bottom. And when you wipe the bottom, remember that we are wiping up an eighth of an inch because we need to make sure that we have a little bit of clearance so when we fire it in the kiln, it doesn't just... Uh, flow right off. So as I wipe, you can kind of see I'm wiping up the corner. And when you wipe with your sponge, you know, you really only want a damp sponge. You don't want it so wet that it's going to drip all over the place. If you do have some textures that are vertical like that, you want to make sure that you get it out of the very bottom of that texture because it can pool and kind of shoot right down the, the side of it. All right, now for my students, you're then going to put this on our cart that's going to be ready for the um, Raku firing. Um, I have a cart near the back door. You're going to set it on there and then we're going to be taking it out um, the whole cart will take out and then we'll fire directly from the cart and after it's fired, we'll put them back on. So that is how you glaze. One other thing that I want to mention, so I just did step five without pointing it out, so I wiped the bottom and up the corners an eighth of an inch. Step number six, this is for my students in ceramics too who made pots that have lids. So where the lid and the pot touch, you have to make sure you clean that off. So for instance, on this pot where the edge of the lid met the uh, gallery of the pot, those two areas had to be clean and I had to clean a little bit up on the edge of the pot. You just have to realize any place that there is glaze, if it's touching another piece, it will get stuck to it. So you have to make sure it's free of glaze. Also, I wanted to show this, this is for all students. If you wanted to do the masked off areas, in my PowerPoint, you might remember seeing several nice student examples where people have taken tape and they have masked off areas. I have a bag of tape that we will use. And I do have links for this sort of tape um, in the video description and on my uh, Amazon storefront. I have a quarter inch and eighth inch tape I have half inch tape and sixteenth of an inch tape as well. So some of these 
they could be pinstriping tape, like automotive pinstriping tape, but a lot of these are white board gridding tape, which uh, is a little bit cheaper than the pinstriping tape, and it works really well. So say for instance on this pot, I went ahead and I put the tape on. When you are taping, you can then glaze right up to the tape or even over the tape, except I have a couple areas here. I might have to take a knife and slice it because it's not laying down properly. But you can glaze right over it and then when it's dry, remove the tape. Um, you don't want to leave the tape on during the firing. You wanna get that tape off. And um, yeah, so again, I would not glaze the upper part or the underneath part of this or the side of the flange or probably down a quarter inch there, all right? And of course, wipe the feet. If you have something that has legs, you'll just wipe the feet. You don't have to have the whole bottom wiped. Now you know how to glaze your Raku and you can proceed and do that and put it on the cart when you're done. Students, when you are all done, again, you're going to be placing it on the cart on the appropriate shelf uh, and spot for your particular class. And we'll just roll that out to the kiln when we're ready to fire.